Thanks, Eric. Can you hear me properly? Yes. Okay. So just double checking. When you see my screen, can you see the? Can you see everything fine? Full screen. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's okay. 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 Thanks. All right. So thanks, Eric. Thanks, Danilo. I really appreciate the invitation to 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 be here with you today. It's just funny because I stayed in the hotel because I got the strong flu. And I came all the way to Sao Paulo because it was I, I came back negative for COVID. So I was hoping to be better today, but you know, I'm here in the hotel right beside the, the IFT. And it's funny because some of you, I met some of you during the breakfast today, right? Uh, you may have noticed because I was the one, uh, the only one wearing the mask and having breakfast uh, outdoors. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's a pity that I'm missing your talks, but I could see that they are being recorded. So I will pay some attention to them. Uh, at a later point. And I really appreciate the invitation from Danilo and Alexandre to, to, to talk today. And um, when I was a bit surprised with the invitation because, you know, it's a, a theoretical physics uh, meeting and I'm neither a theoretical physicist nor a physicist. I'm, a, I'm an engineer and um, I kind of work with a little bit of supramolecular assembly of uh, polymer, polymer particles, polymer chains and uh, superstructures. So today I brought a topic here about the supermolecular assembly of nanostructure biomass, but uh, I made this light adaptation to my, my title. So I'm talking about I'm 100% experimentalist. So I'm going to show here some experiments that we have been playing on, uh, playing on during the last couple of years. I'm not presenting anything old. So everything is sort of ongoing and needing theoretical input, right? So uh, things that uh, are going on at the moment and could benefit from having input from theoretical physicists or uh, any modeler and uh, simulator. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I attended this uh, extremely nice uh, school that was put together also by Danilo at the same building. And that's because, you know, I've always tried to connect with uh, theoretical physicists or theoretical chemists. But the language is different from us, from experimentalists and from engineers. So I didn't know, uh, I mean, Andre is from Uska, he might be in the audience. I tried to email him, uh, email him a couple of times, but you know, things that seem simple for us are complex for modeling, for simulating, and from, you know, uh, giving the answers that we want are not always straightforward. So I came to this school just to learn a bit the language of, uh, of you, you know, of yourself. And it was amazing. So just uh, uh, a brief brief background. So I, I am an engineer and I worked a little bit with uh, colloid physical chemistry. And now I'm a professor, assistant professor actually of materials engineering. So I work with polymer science at the University of Sao Carlos, which is, uh, as you know, in the two hours and a half driving from Sao Paulo, sort of. So as we work with uh, polymer science, we always struggle so switch from what we call the linear economy. When you take the atom from nature, you process, you transform, you consume, and you discard. So trash is generated at the end. So we want to vanish this concept and put forward the concept of circular economy. When you take the atom from nature, of course, everything comes from there. You process, you transform, you consume, and then you refurbish, you remanufacture, you reprocess, you recycle, and then you put back in the cycle. You don't throw away. So there is no, ideally, there is no trash being generated, right? So it's a, a concept that I will not discuss here, but the concept that we try to put forward is, is to, to do it circularly, but using biomass. So using uh, molecules, particles, and, you know, building blocks that come from nature from renewable sources, right? So from forests, from agriculture. So feeding the, the economic cycle in a circular way and using biomass. Uh, and what kind of biomass? So just to put forward what, what we do in the group, uh, we use a lot of underexploited biomass, things that are thrown away, that are not used, but they are abundant and there are, you know, um, just wasted. This is what we call the trash to cash approach. And one of them is food waste. So a lot of things from food waste can be 
I mean, can be extracted, can be used to produce materials. So last year we put together this uh, article that was uh, demonstrating how to take whatever lasts from the agricultural chain, whatever is wasted, whatever is residue, right, in a circular uh, concept, and take monomers, molecules, small molecules that have the capacity to be polymerized into macromolecules, right? To isolate biopolymers, I mean polymers that come from biomass, but that are already macromolecular, and especially collets, so particles, not uh, chains, but uh, uh, particles, elongated, spherical, platelets, you know, that come from food waste at any point that we can extract and convert into uh, polymer-based materials, right? Um, and the most abundant biomass that we have in Brazil is wood. Uh, and wood is a lot of, uh, denotes a lot of waste and important waste in food processing because you have pruning, you have, I mean, not going into details, but a waste is a hierarchical material that can be deconstructed, deconstructed into smaller building blocks, either chains, the most important uh, the major component of food is, is of course cellulose, right? So as you go down in scale, you can reach a fiber bundle, <laughs> sorry. And if you go uh, comminuting again, you have the fibrils. And if you go down again in scale, you have the chains. So uh, cellulose is a polymer of glucose, right? So a lot of sugar units, uh, glucopyranose units that bind together covalently into high molecular weight uh, uh, chains. And these chains, they are uh, bundled in nature. Like this is a chain, if you can see me, this is another chain. So several chains that they get bundled, right? Like the cross section of a, of, a, of a cord, for instance. And depending on the way you deconstruct it, you can have either it like a fibril, like a spaghetti, like a a meal, right? So a very elongated fibrils that are composed of several chains, but that they are flexible because it alternates domains that are highly crystalline and highly uh, amorphous disorder. So these uh, amorphous domains, these amorphous uh, regions, they are responsible for the flexibility. So there is enough degree of freedom, of freedom and, and, and size, you know, the aspect ratio. So the length divided by the thickness or the diameter is very high. So you can have a lot of entanglement in these nanostructures. Uh, if you do a chemical hydrolysis, for instance, a, uh, an acid hydrolysis, what you are going to get rid of are these amorphous regions. So you, are, you will end up with the crystalline domains and they are more brittle, they are more stiff, and they are less flexible. So I compare them with like rice, uh, rice, you know, because they're uh, like uh, needles. And this is different in the sense of materials assembly. But I'm showing you that I'm going downwards in scale, but then I have to build the material that is macro scale again. So there seems to be a paradox, right? Why do I deconstruct and then reconstruct? This is important because uh, when we get the building blocks, we assemble them in the colloidal state and we really architect the material the way we want. So several uh, materials, they, are, they, they have the properties, they behave as they do, not because of the composition, not only because of the composition, but because of the way they are architected, right? And going top down, being able to design the materials and then going bottom up again, uh, might have uh, good consequences in the, the design and fabrication of materials. So uh, last year as well, we put like design rules to work with biomass. It was a chemical reviews paper in which we go downwards in size, we surface and bulk modify chemically or physically, these building blocks. And we tailor the supramolecular interactions, depending on the size scale and the length scale, to assemble the materials, right? From the sol gel and then the gel solid consolidation. So to have materials with tailored properties and with tailored uh, behavior, right? To, 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 to feed the, 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 the society. So depending on the scale that we are talking on, we can have different forces playing 
the major role, right? So here we are in the molecular level, and then we go up into the colloidal scale, and then we go up in usually the processing methods that involve capillary forces, dry influxes, shear, in orientation, right? But uh, I'm going to talk about a, a little bit of the supramolecular in the electrostatics, and and why? I mean, I could I could uh, several are playing are at play concomitantly, right? Simultaneously, but electrostatic is interesting because it allows me. I mean, it's reversible. It's supramolecular. It's not covalent, and it allows me to easily plug and unplug turn on and switch on and switch off, right? Uh, this is what I'm showing in this slide. So the electrostatic, the, this is easily, easily tunable. Why? Because we have orthogonal um, triggers like pH, like ionic strength, like valency that really uh, shift, right? From a solution state to a complex state. It, you can even uh, trigger like a uh, uh, isotropic to pneumatic transition. I saw that there was a talk yesterday about the pneumatic transition. You can even reach chiral pneumatics. I'm sure Andre will talk about chirality later this afternoon, right? Just playing with the pH and with the ionic strength. And the beauty of this is it's reversible. So whenever you see an arrow here, it's uh, both ways, right? You can really do a round trip. So let me slip a little bit on two specific cases. One is polyantholite complexation that we play a little bit on. So what is a polyantholite? It's a polymer, actually a block copolymer, and one block is cationic and one block is anionic, so positive and negatively charged respectively. So let's get the first case when we have a high pH and a low ionic strength. What does it mean if the pH is higher than the pKa of the, the of the of all blocks, right? So only the anionic blocks are going to be active, deprotonated, and charged. The other one is going to be neutral. So at low ionic strength and high pH, you have a solution because one chain only sees the negative chain, the same charge of the opposite uh, of the neighbor chain, right? If we go down in pH a lot and we surpass the uh, at the lower threshold of the, the, the pKa, then only the cationic blocks are going to be active. So positively charged chains see the positively charged things on, on the opposite way and they repel each other and they reach a state of solution. This is in low ionic strength. So I'm keeping the ionic strength fixed and just playing with pH. As we go intermediate, intermediate in pH, meaning that we are above the pKa of the cationic uh, of the anionic block and below the pKa of the cationic block, we can have both charges active, right? So one chain having both charges, and they can easily complex. This is what we call the precipitation. So we are in this region of the pseudo phase diagram, right? So let's keep this pH that can trigger the, the complexation and so precipitation and go up in ionic strength. So as we put salt or, you know, small electrolytes, they are responsible for screening the electrical double layer. And you can read, you can reach again a solution stage because I'm going to show in a minute that charges are always compensated depending on the species that are compensating the charge. So this is what we call the saltinine. And as we go higher and higher in ionic strength and we put more salt, then there is the saltinol. The electrical double layer is so thin that it barely exists. And then Van der Waals forces, Van der Waals forces start to take place in attractive means and not uh, repulsive, okay? <coughs> Sorry. Uh, the other case that, I've, that I like is what we call the saloplasticity. Uh, if you have heard about materials processing, there is the thermoplastic, materials that flow upon temperature and shear. So temperature does the thermoplastics for recycling, for processing, the same that salt does for the saloplastics, right? So at low ionic strengths, you can see that the polycation compensates the charges of the polyanion and vice versa, right? So the charges are always compensated. This is what we call the intrinsic charge compensation. As we put salt, you see, you see it's both ways, right? So you can put and remove salt, it's supramolecular. So the small electrolytes here, they're going to compensate the charges 
So we're increasing the doping level. So the charges are still compensated, but not by the other polar electrolyte, but what, but the counter counter ions, right? The counter anion and the counter cation. And as you put more salt, there is fully extrinsic charge compensation. So all charges are being compensated, matched by the small electrolytes. And what is the implication of this? You can see here that you can go all the way from a solid liquid phase separation in which, you know, the, the, the species complex completely and expel any water so it's not hydrated, it's a real solid that it's going to precipitate to what we call the coacervation or the coacervate, which is a liquid liquid phase separation. So there are two liquid phases, not a solid and a liquid anymore, two liquid phases, one in the bottom because of density, right? Rich on the polyelectrolyte complex and one in the top poor, but it's still contained in the polyelectrolyte complex. And as you put more salt, you can reach a true or uh, I mean a solution state and it's reversible as you take out salt by dilution by dialysis by ion exchange you 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 really go into the other way so i'm going to showcase a little bit uh, some efforts experimental as i told you efforts that are still ongoing and then benefit from having charge or from from having this supramolecular assembly of uh, biomass i'm going to talk basically of nanocellulose and mostly nan cellulose nanofibrils not to big make, make it broad right so uh, one example is like in a colloidal system that is in a motion the second one the third one is a solid material the second one is somehow intermediate so it's a solid like hydrogel hydrated gel swollen gel and the fourth one is a super particle that i find interesting so i would like to share with you i'll go quick so i have time to talk about all those but uh if you need more details we can discuss at, at a later point so as you know, emotions are multi-phase systems of uh, non-miscible species, and they are not um, in, a, in thermodynamic equilibrium if the droplets are small, right? Uh, they can be made uh, kinetically stable, so metastable. And this, we use some block copolymers or even polymers as, as thickeners, right, to increase the viscosity of the continuous medium and reduce droplet uh, co um, collision and coalescence, but uh, of course there are the classical surfactants, but I'm talking about polymers here. So uh, there are also the, the biomass, or I mean this, the particles that sit in the interface and they create a real shell of, uh, of particles, of structures that prevent droplets from seeing each other and from coalescing. Uh, this depends for surfactants, we have the HLB number. For, surf, for particles, which we call pickering emotions, it depends on the wettability of the particles. So depending on how water, how the phases wet the particle, it will sit in the interface, you know? Because if it's too hydrophilic, it will go to the water phase. If it's too hydrophobic, it will go to the organic phase. So it, it should have an intermediate wettability for it to sit in the interface, right? So what we do with cellulose, so we deconstruct biomass, and it's extremely hydrophilic, the, the fibrils, not the crystals, but it's hydrophilic. Uh, so it won't be able to go to the interface by itself. It's not spontaneous. So we have a toolbox for modifying chemically, chemically the surface of the, 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 the fibrils. And this is interesting because cellulose has a lot of hydroxyl groups that are easy to attach whatever we want, right? So uh, we, we do some acetylation, some isobutyration, uh, to increase the hydrophobicity of the cellulose nanofibrils, and they will go spontaneously to the interface. But there is another possibility without playing with these guys, you know, because there are drawbacks, there are side effects. There is the option of introducing surface charge. As I told you, these hydroxyls that are here, they are functional groups eager to react. So, for instance, in this case, we have a epoxide ring, there is a nucleophilic attack onto this um, hydroxyls, and we can attach, you know, covalently graft a quaternary ammonium group that is positively charged at all pH that are reasonable for us, right? And uh, in, a, in an emotion, it's often, it's, uh, it's likely that the droplets are negatively charged. So we have a cationic species and, and an ionic system and an ionic interface because of free fatty acids and different stuff, right? 
So uh, when we get the, uh, this is the work of Carolini, a former PhD in the group. Uh, at, I was still in Unicamp in the group of uh, Professor Watson, always was my supervisor for postdoc. Uh, we, we compared the instability index. I'm talking, I'm talking about thermodynamic stability. I'm talking about kinetic stability. We have the same particle, the same cellulose than a fibril. One is an ionic, so uh, it's oxidized, and one is cationic. Same size, same properties, same crystallinity, <coughs> but different surface charges. So the stability of the anionic system was less than one day. So the instability index was quite high. And the cationic, sorry, the cationic species are still sitting in the bench with micro, microscopic stability. <coughs> sorry. Why, why, right? So we went for AFM and we could see that the droplets <coughs> were completely coated by this, uh, by this uh, cellulose nanofibrils. But they were not only in the interface, they were, they were also in the bulk. But of course, AFM has to dry the sample and then we went to, for a cryogenic TM, right? Cryo TM. <coughs> and we can see a dual, a double stabilization mechanism. So a particle sitting in the interface, and this is easy to see from uh, interfacial tension experiments, and also a network formation in the continuous phase, so thickening the continuous phase. This is something that is interesting for stabilization of multi-phase systems. The second showcase that I would like to provide is a lyotropic liquid crystal that is called cubosome. It's a bicontinuous cubic phase, so meaning that, that it has both hydrophobic and hydrophilic channels, so it's good to host both hydrophobic and hydrophilic uh, components. And it's made of like a uh, phytantriol. There is a straightforward recipe. <coughs> and it's made stable, kinetically stable by a copolymer that is called, uh, it's a P PPO, PO, PPO, polypropylene oxide, polyethylene oxide, polypropylene oxide copolymer, right? So it's a real uh, cubic phase and it's good for hosting um, molecules of different uh, chemical features. The point is that they are small, tiny, small particles. Not that tiny, I mean 200, 300 nanometers, but they're still tiny. And we try to incorporate them into polymer uh, membranes, wet membranes. And these membranes, they, are, they have a mesh size much larger than the particles. So uh, we can incorporate, you can see that for, by the fluorescence, that whatever is fluorescent here is the cubosome with the dye, with the fluorescent dye. But uh, you can really see from SACS that, uh, that, that you have the, the, the pristine mesh and the cubic phase, the typical cubic phase of cubosome when you have the incorporation, but you have a lot of leaching. You lose a lot of cubosome because what we are trying to do is to have soup with the fork, right? So you have a big mesh and tiny small particles, so they will eventually run away quickly. So what can we do with electrostatics to prevent that? We switched some of the phytantriol molecules here by cationic surfactants. In this case, it was CTAB, right? So we put surface positively charged groups in the surface of the cubosome, right? And we oxidize the polymer gel. In this case, it was hyaluronic acids, but we, we've also done with uh, cellulose, bacterial cellulose, and we cross-linked. So uh, we have now a big mesh still, but negatively charged and the positively charged cubosome. And we can still see, you know, the incorporation, it's fine, it's well distributed, it's beautiful, but the leaching, you can see here the leaching. When the cationic cubosome content is low, the leaching takes place completely within 24 hours. When we put more cationic cubosomes, it still does, but it takes much more time. And for high cationic cubosomes content, then it barely leaches. So it takes much longer to, 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 to this drawback. The third example that I would like to give is still in cationic uh, cellulose, but in solid material, uh, usually foams. So we have different procedures to produce these foams. This is a self-condensation reaction that expands this, the colloidal suspension, and we then quench, we then cross-link and, uh, you know, maintain the structure. 
The other point is to do like what we call the cryo templating. So we freeze cast and use ice as a sacrificial template because ice grows, uh, confine the particles, the solids, right? And then the ice melts or gets sublime, right? It gets uh, a little felized. And we, we end up with a foam, with a dry foam that is positively charged because of the groups that I introduced in cellulose, right? And they're really good, they're really efficient in inhibiting microbial growth, in activating bacterial cells that are negatively charged, right? So these foams, they were basically done for biocidal, uh, biocidal applications, not only because of COVID, but... Uh, it was even before COVID, but it's still ongoing. But we use this as a substrate, as it is positively charged, to grow multi-layers of oppositely charged molecules, particles, you know? So this is what we call the layer. This is quite typical. You've seen this, the layer by layer assembly of uh, multi-layers, right? Uh, so we can play with the surface charge. The more surface charge we have, the more the adsorption of the oppositely charged layers, right? So this is a typical QCMD measurement. So as mass is adsorbed onto the substrate, the frequency changes, right? Decreases, there is a minus here, and you can really see the mass adsorbing. So no charge, almost no adsorption. Intermediate charge, intermediate adsorption. High surface charge density, right? So higher, uh, absorption efficiency. But why am I talking about this? Because I really like the approach of a professor from MIT. She's called Paula Hammond. She's brilliant. And she uses this approach, this layer by layer assembly to compartmentalize stuff. She's in the bio, bio field and she works like growth factor, uh, enzymes, um, RNA, uh, drugs, whatever she wants to compartmentalize, she does using this these uh, layers, you know? <coughs> and it's interesting because after you do this, you have to get rid, right, for release or for uh, growth factors to play their role or for uh, RNA to reach their targets, right? And you have different mechanisms for the delivery, either non-responsive and responsive. So talking about the responsive, you can swell the multi-layers so the diffusional path is easier, is smaller, is less tortuous, right? You can have dissolution if the multi layers are hydrosoluble, for instance, water soluble. You can have degradation, for instance, by enzymes or in body, right? And I would like to mention again that we can reach this reversibility using salt, right? That's why the saloplasticity comes to play. Because the, the, the charged molecules. Uh, so just before I move, Eric, how am I doing with time? So you are actually done already. So you probably all right. Yeah, you should try to wrap it okay. up. All right, thank you. So the, the chains, the isolated polymer molecules, they have a, a lot of degree of freedom. They have a lot of flexibility. They can uh, coil. They can expand, right, freely. There's a lot of Brownian motion, right? So complexation at the ideal points, they, it takes place instantaneously, the charge matching, right? So this is what I, I extrapolate for the current because sometimes when you work, for instance, with a composite, you don't want the, the filler to be concentrated, to be aggregated. You want it to be spread, evenly spread. So dispersive and distributed properly. So uh, when we mix those guys together, we want to do it controlled in a controlled way. So for instance, if we go for pH seven, there is a polycation, there is a polyanion, but the polycation is above the pKa. So it's not charged. You can see here from the electrophoretic mobility that the charge is almost zero. And the polyanion is above the pKa, so it's fine, it's deprotonated. Zeta potential roughly minus 35, minus 40, right? So neutral, negative, it will not complex. You can see here that nothing changes in the frequency. So we can mix them properly and then we can trigger the complexation. How? Removing salt or switching pH. 
So if we do the same, the same system at the pH four, for instance, then the cationic blocks are going to be active, protonated, and the anionic blocks are still deprotonated. So you have like 35 minus 35, it's qualitative, you know, but uh, then uh, complexation takes place. You can see here that when the pH is shift four, I hope you can see it, um, frequency changes and uh, complexation takes place. But the beauty is that it's reversible. And this is important for recyclability. The same thing that I want to complex, I want to decomplex in a controlled fashion, right? So we did, this is a wet resilience. What is this? It's a very simple experiment. You have water, you have your foam, you put it there stirring for 24 hours and you see what, what lasts and what was dispersed, right? So I'm playing here with decomplexation, separating the complex species. So let's, let's see uh, the wet resilience. So the higher the wet resilience, the stronger is the complexation. When it's a stronger, as expected, when I have a proper ratio between cationic and ionic species, right? But when we do it with low ionic strength, regardless, not regardless, but still, if you have only a little bit of one charged species, the wet resilience is going to be higher. As we go up in ionic strength, then we get rid even of the strongest uh, complexes, right? So it's really electrostatically driven, I mean, tropically driven, but uh, not, not Colombic, this is what I mean, but really dependent on um, ionic strength and pH. Just to finish, uh, I just showed you that cellulose may kill microorganisms, right? If it's cationic and depending on the mechanism and, and on the condition and on the cell, if it's gram positive or gram negative or, you know, uh, fungus or bacteria or viruses, it can, it can interact with the cationic cellulose or any cationic species, right? But there is the case where I need cellulose not to kill it. So I, I should not have surface charge, at least positive, right? Uh, so this is a showcase that I would like to show you. <coughs> Sorry. In which I don't want cellulose to cue what is inside there. So you have a suspension. It's highly hydrated. It's viscous because I'm talking about nanofibrils that entangle, right? And uh, aprisonate water. And as we dry, what we do, we pack, we pack the chains, right? So we increase gradually the, 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 the solid content and the number of contacts between the fibrils until I have something that is interlocked. Sometimes I even don't have to chemically cross-link because this interlocking, this entanglement is enough to give me uh, robustness and resilience even in aqueous medium, right? So depending on the way we do it, if we go for a hydrophilic substrate, we have what we call a film, a flat film, because the solution, usually water, will wet, spread, and dry as a film. When we have a highly hydrophobic substrate, it will not wet, so it will assemble like in a droplet shape, right? And as we dry it, then we have what we call particles, like round shape structures. And I call them supraparticles because they are particles made of several tiny smaller particles. You're going to see what I mean. So let's say you have like a silica or, you know, any particle that has an organic functionality at the surface. For you to bind them together, you could do what? Sintering, thermal annealing, but then you sort of erase the organic functionality. That might be uh, light re responsive or pH responsive or enzymes or antioxidants or whatever you have to, you need to be there to, to have there. You can use polymer binders. This is traditionally used. I mean the, the isolated chains, but it creates a film around surrounding the particle that in some cases can hinder, you know, can hinder the functionality. Is it still active? but it's hidden by the polymer layer that creates sort of a film, right? 
In the case of supraparticles, there is this beautiful work from uh, Bruno, which is a colleague from Finland, that was showing that we can have the particles interlocked by cellulose nanofibrils without hindering the functionalities, right? So he proposed a universal uh, interlocking mechanism for small, tiny small 20 nanometers or bigger particles, 40 micrometers, cationic, anionic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, of uh, polymer, inorganic, organic, you know, different uh, particles that were bound together by cellulose nanofibrils upon drying and interlocking on the top of a superhydrophobic substrate. What caught my attention here was that he was able to do it with pollen. And pollen, you know, by plants, from plants, it's one of the most delicate, the more, most sensible structures in nature. It is designed by nature to be like that, right? So I said, okay, you were able to produce a super particle using pollen, which is quite sensitive. So let's do it with, with, a, with a bacteria, with an yeast, with a microorganism. So we did a colloidal suspension using hydrophobic or hydrophilic silica, cellulose nanofibrils, and yeast cells. And we, we got a super hydrophobic substrate. Uh, sorry, Kai. And we do, could you just, yes. Could you just wrap it up? Because, I mean, we are really over time already. Are we? OK. I didn't know that. Sorry. So uh, we produce this uh, round-shaped particles that are living. You know, they are able to convert glucose in ethanol. So you can see here that uh, I hope you can see. And as uh, CO2 is also produced, and the solubility in water is low, it sticks to the particle and increases the buoyancy. You can see the particles moving up. As they reach the interface with air, the solubility of CO2 is high, so they release the CO2 and again uh, precipitate. So there is a vertical movement depending on the yeast activity, you know, in the particle um, Activity. So, just to finish, uh, I, I bring here some questions to struggle with that I am at least struggling, and that maybe some of you can help me working on it a bit. So, uh, as I said, at ideal conditions, the chains, the polymer chains, they complex instantaneously. The particles, the cellulose nanofibrils, for instance, they take a while. They do complex, but it takes a while. So, there is a kinetic component there besides the entropic, right? So, what is the effect of size, of flexibility, crystallinity, of aspect ratio, of charge density on the complexation phenomenon? Phenomenon. What about the decomplexation as we are also looking into uh, complexing, decomplexing? Also, introducing these charged groups in the particles changes a lot the aspect ratio and the molecular weight. So it's not only beautiful. It's, uh, I mean, it's, there is side effect. There is drawback. Right, so both being extremely important for their rheological behavior. So, can we predict an optimum compromise between charge and thickening effect in rheological behavior to stabilize, for instance, multi-phase systems? And uh, finally, the faster the yeast metabolizes sugars, the faster it produces CO2, and the faster it moves upwards. Right. So, how to couple these biochemical reactions? To the fluid dynamics, so we have uh, enough uh, subsides to induce an, opt an optimum reaction, sugar consumption, and movement in the vert vertical axis, which might be interesting for mass transport. With this, I would like to thank again the organi organizing committee for the invitation and all of you for the kind of attention. I'm just sorry that I'm not there, but. Uh, uh, you can track what we've been doing in our website, and I'm glad to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Caio. Questions? So, Caio, I do not see any questions here, so uh, I would like to thank you once more for your talk. Uh, just Thank a you. quick Thank announcement. Uh, 